All right, so the, the next set of species to move in or the next seer, so label this as seer C and seer D, the next set of species to move in are also trees, but these fall into the category of hardwoods. When we think of hardwoods and softwoods, we think of wood quality, right? It's, it's durability, it's strength. Uh, birch and aspen, trees that grow very quickly, and their wood is not very good. It's not very strong. And in fact, these trees are limited in how tall they can get because of the strength of their stems. If you think of uh, birches, at some point their limbs or the stem gets so long that they collapse under their own weight. Or in a good snowstorm, they break off. Whereas these more slower going, tr growing trees that fall into the hardwood category, <clears throat> the grain on the wood, those growth rings are much tighter because of slower growth. They're spending more resources on higher quality molecules to build a stem that really is capable of supporting a tree <clears throat> that's quite large and quite tall. Around here, you could think of like oaks and maples, uh, maybe cherry. And these trees get taller than those, <clears throat> so eventually they get tall enough to shade these out. These need some sort of a, an established canopy in order for the seedlings to develop. So if you think of you know, maybe my birch here, providing enough shade <clears throat> that one of these maples can start growing, <clears throat> and then eventually this maple will get tall enough to shade out that birch. But the birch is needed because the seedlings of these hardwoods can't hack full sun. They need some kind of shading in order for them to develop properly. So these birches are necessary along with aspens and these other softwoods to get development of these hardwoods. Then, from the hardwoods, uh, I'm thinking in Pennsylvania here and in New England, uh, there would be two other types of trees that uh, have much more shady requirements as seedlings and can get that much taller than an oak or a maple. And around here, uh, these two trees would be white pine and hemlock. Uh, mostly hemlock in our neck of the woods, though there are some uh, white pines. <clears throat> this sear is interesting because from this seer, you don't move on to anything else, <clears throat> right? The recruitment of these trees occurs in the presence of these trees. So if you know anything about hemlock, uh, if you've been in a stand of hemlock around here, uh, they're very good at shading, and it, it can be quite dark underneath an established hemlock canopy. The hemlock seedlings require that very dark uh, shading that that established canopy offers. <clears throat> and that allows these to germinate and grow. So the hemlock only establish in the presence of these trees, plus they can establish in the presence of other hemlock. So this final sear <clears throat> is kind of the terminal stage of this old field succession model. And in fact, uh, this final stage is referred to as the climax. Uh, some people will call it the climax stage, or you could refer to these as climax species. They are the end result of this very elaborate successional process. Now, a couple things to point out. I was trying to point these out without really saying it, but <clears throat> let's go through in more explicitly uh, develop this model a little further because it is kind of interesting. What, what this model suggests is only these species can colonize the old field. 
these species modify the environment to support the recruitment of these species in C or B, and these modify the environment to support these species, which modify the environment to support these species, which modify the environment to support these species, which modify the environment to support these, and then these uh, allow for kind of self promotion or uh, this kind of uh, maintenance of this seer, and it doesn't go anyplace else except this seer. So for ecologists, the old field succession model that was well developed back in the late 1800s, and we've got over 150 years of old field succession data because uh, it's been that long since these fields were abandoned in the late 1800s. We have all this data, but really what that leads us to is a type of succession called facilitation or facilitated succession. Under the facilitated succession model, you need seers to promote the growth of subsequent seers. Each of these seers that exist are promoting the development of a subsequent seer. These species change the environment to promote their growth, and so on and so on, all the way through this model. This facilitated succession model is kind of the classic succession model that gets presented. <clears throat> Here in uh, Glacier Bay, Alaska, we would see a similar kind of thing. The glacier recedes, there's all this soil left behind where the glacier pounded all the rocks down into little pieces, and you get these pioneer species, these early successional species, followed by herbaceous species that are more case-selected followed by these kind of shrubs that ultimately leads to what would be the climax species in Glacier Bay are these spruce trees here, which represents the final sear in this long successional model. Okay? Note that also under this uh, facilitated succession that, that we've kind of developed, uh, in addition to plant species, we could talk in some cases about other types of species. So <clears throat> there's a pretty good, pretty good uh, data on the <clears throat> human gut flora. That would be the grouping of species that exists within the large intestine of humans that you initially have a group of species that are the earliest colonizers to the large intestine. This group of species is arriving uh, and setting up shop because of the breast milk that's provided by mom. This milk sets up a particular environment that promotes the growth of certain species. These species then begin to modify the gut uh, biome a little bit, altering its pH, the concentration of specific uh, final molecules <clears throat> that these organisms are producing as waste products that then facilitate the development <clears throat> of another group of bacterial species that then alters the gut right a little bit to promote another sear, and so on and so on, until you would reach what we would refer to as that climax community that exists within the human gut. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, successional model uh, for gut flora would take a while to develop. It's not like you instantaneously develop that final group of species that would be in our guts. <clears throat> that this process would take, you know, weeks to get to Seer B and maybe uh, months to get to Seer C and maybe a couple of years to get to this climax community once we have this kind of adult diet kind of worked out. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, we would expect each time we uh, view this process occurring that it should follow the same sort of progression 
from these early species all the way up to the final community. Just as in <coughs> old field succession models, you have to start with those pioneer species and then move your way through the uh, herbaceous and then to the shrubs, the softwoods, the hardwoods until you get to the climax community, you can't just start here. You have to facilitate the growth of more species by the present species altering the environment somehow to promote that growth. Okay? All right, I'll, I'll see you next time. Take care.